Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided with perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Well, in the near term, uh, the large low pressure system that's been taking shape over the last day and a half, starting first in the central plains, then diving down, uh, down toward the Gulf Coast here, will start to really pull into the northeast over the next 24 to 36 hours. And this is going to be the source of the uh, of the big nor'easter we've been talking about for for a while here. Okay, just taking a look at how much snowfall we've already got out of this. Now, this was valid early this morning, uh, 6 a.m. We can see that throughout parts of the central plains, a lot of places in here picking up anywhere between two and some places over eight inches of snow. In fact, there's some pockets in here of, of Oklahoma that have been getting quite a bit of snow uh, this year, while other places to the north of it have really missed out on it, especially in South Dakota. Wait until you see I dry as show it's been in South Dakota lately. I did get some light snow in Illinois and Indiana, but the big snowfall event is going to be going up the East Coast. And so I just want to show it to you real quick on the high resolution models. Looking at the high res NAM, we are concerned uh, throughout the day today about some freezing rain risk right here along the Appalachian Mountains, but you're going to see the snow spreading from the eastern Corn Belt here, really getting into eastern parts uh, of Ohio, but then really kind of attacking <laughs> parts of West Virginia, uh, getting into um, parts of Pennsylvania and New York. Now, the NAM model has come in better agreement with what's uh, been seen here by the European all along, with this system kind of taken on off here by the time we get into about 5 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. And that system will move out pretty quickly. There could be some light snow showers on the backside tucked into the upper level low here. And meanwhile, our next system did kind of come into parts of the uh, Pacific Northwest. Now, real quick, just to show you the near term, there's a frontal boundary uh, that is draped with this low that's going through parts of uh, Manitoba after coming out of Saskatchewan. And we could get some mixed precip right here uh, in this part of North and South Dakota stretching back over to Wyoming as we kind of play this out into early Friday morning. See that narrow frontal band of some light snow showers. So don't be surprised if you see some of that. But let's go, go right on over to the European model and just kind of pick up on this pattern beyond that point. So there's our first big nor'easter of the year running up the East Coast, and it's out pretty quickly. And the European model's done a fantastic fantastic job with this. High pressure comes in behind it, but if you notice, the high pressure slides here over the Appalachian Mountains. So the cold air will be here at the end of the week, but a return of warmth uh, right here in the central part of the U.S. with some strong winds. And that next low takes off and goes up toward um, you know, the Hudson Bay here. So that one's just going to drag a front through, as you see here by the end of the week, and bring up our chances of precip right into this area. And then we're going to get into the weekend. And we're just going to watch, again, the, the, the one kind of stalled out frontal boundary here. So possibly over the weekend, some, some snow in this area. But our lows over the next, gosh, over the next week are really going to target running along this track. So it's going to be up here, you know, Highway 16 running, you know, toward the Hudson Bay. That, that seems to be the trajectory. And the tail end of them keeps kind of lashing in here to the northwest, keeping precip high. I'll show you that total amount in a little bit. You know, just for the fun of it, let's let the model play out and let's get all the way to here. This would be the 12Z on the 23rd. Now, the operational European at this point, so I'm, I'm kind of looking at Christmas here, is trying to put this monstrous low uh, somewhere here over, you know, Wisconsin. Very, very strong winds and some snow on the north and back side of it. So it's just something to watch. It's pretty far out there uh, at this point in the operational run and it's bounced around quite a bit. But if I just take you out to Christmas Eve, you know, we could be looking at another storm system going up here through out of Ontario into Quebec and draping its front here. But again, we're pretty far out in a single operational model run to put much trust in it. So let's come back to the near term very quickly here. Through Saturday evening, this is the latest from the European model. This does include the snow we had here early this morning uh, in parts of Illinois and Indiana. From there, I want to show you the next week's precip from the Zero Z uh, European. And I just want to point out with after that big low exits, okay, the storm track, like I said, does this, and this is just not good for bringing precip values back up in the plains or really in the Intermountain West. Uh, it's really only this pocket of the Pacific Northwest is going to be quite wet, and you can see how dry things are without that subtropical jet cutting into the southwestern United States. Now, if we go back here real quick, you can see major liquid equivalent amount, and a lot of this is going to be snow here in the Cascades, several feet of it, in fact, and some of that does get down here into the Sierra Nevada, but just want to bring you up to speed on basin average snow water content. So these are percentages. And like I always say this time of year, 
December 15th, it's great to look at these numbers, but they're most important once we get into February and March because that'll tell us total snowfall for the year. So we, we do see a lot of our values below 100% here, and thankfully we're going to see these numbers climbing in the coming days with that precipitation that's on its way. The Sierra Nevada generally sitting you know 60 to 90% of their normal snowpack in these four reporting stations. Now after that, when we did just go get past the big nor'easter and start thinking about what the following week is going to give us, we do see that there is there's just a large pocket in here that's going to be relatively dry compared to normal, uh, and and that's going to become just an issue as we start to think about the bigger issues with drought going on there. So let's kind of take a look at that. This is the last 30 days of precipitation uh, expressed as a percent of normal. And what I want to focus in on are the, are the deep reds. So there are parts of northern Nebraska getting here into South Dakota and North Dakota, and even this part of Montana that are currently sitting between 0 and 10% of normal precip. Same thing down in Southern California and this part of New Mexico and Texas. So I'm, I'm just trying to identify those dry areas. And so to think about where the air is coming from, this is kind of a, a fun simulation here. So I'm using data uh, from the high split model, which is running the GFS. And I'm concerned, let me just put a white uh, you know, box on it here. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at that area, all right? Where is the air coming from over this week? And I just want you to see that it's, it's, it's here. Well, I better draw that in a different color. How about we draw that in red? Watch over here on the graphic on the left. This is the trajectory of the flow. Now, why I, I bring that up is because to get big precipitation in California, it, it needs to come off of Hawaii, right? So we got to get flow like this. And we just haven't seen that at all uh, this year. So going from there, why don't we now just target a, a spot in South Dakota? We'll go right here to Mitchell. That's where I did this one. And once again, do you see with me, the, the air is really quite mild and coming out of the Pacific from this trajectory. See, these are back trajectories. We're not seeing it come from here, from the Arctic. And as a result of that, we get a flow pattern that does something like like this and all the activity tends to move to the east this ridge tends to bring in warmer weather and we also tend to get a lot of upper level convergence here which tends to keep things over on the drier side so with that milder pacific air look at it coming in like this the troughs are over the east in the day uh, next five days and then as you get out here today five through ten you just continue to see that more mild pacific air here with much of the coldest air kind of getting anchored here in northern canada back up toward the arctic and alaska we hang out our cooler bias across the southeast though and getting all the way up to day 10 through 15, again, look at that pattern just favoring the warmer conditions uh, in the western half of, of North America, honestly, with the coolest air to the east where the troughs seem to keep pushing on through here as we work out toward the end of this month. Now, when we start to ask ourselves, are there signals for change? I'm going to start in the Arctic first, and I want to focus your attention uh, right here. So we have seen lately after November finished with a lot of low pressure over the Arctic, we're now back over to a high pressure cell sitting there. And that tends to give us uh, the negative values of the Arctic oscillations. That's what the graph is that's down here on the bottom. Now to show you what that means for December and January, I've got a correlation map over here. So now this is correlation with the AO. So we're make sure this is clear where you see the warmer colors here that's what it would be if the AO was positive okay if the AO is negative you would flip this color spectrum and it would be cooler there so we notice that in our most recent forecast we have seen the warmer conditions here and the cooler there and that's partly because the AO is down here that's just part of the story there's another part to this as well and it has to do with the polar vortex so what we're going to watch over here on the left are the 10 millibar heights. So this is deep in the stratosphere. And I'm watching for any major elongations, disruptions, or slowing down of the polar vortex. And while over the next 10 days it moves, it's just moving here. And we, we tend to keep overall a pretty tight circulation. In other words, I'm not seeing any major stratospheric warming events that could really disrupt this in the near term. Although we do get some warming here over Siberia and the same thing over this part of North America. Now this is in the stratosphere. And just come over here to the graphic that's on the, on the, on the right. So the polar vortex is regaining some strength back up into its normal range. And it, it's kind of staying in here through the next 10 to 15 days. We have to just watch out for the big drops. And I keep repeating that in every video, but that's really what we're going to have to, to, to watch here. And I don't have any indications that that's going to happen and, and get connected with the troposphere in the near term. So that's what's going on in the tropics. 
So if we just let the models run this out through the first week of January, they tend to just repeat what we've had, the mild air across much of North America. Now remember, mild for late December and early January is still cold, but it's not the, the brutal cold that we can get. And the cooler air just stays tucked here in both the ECMWF, which is on the right, and the new GFS Extended, which is over here on the left. And again, we're going all the way out to the first week uh, of, of January. Now, how do you interpret this? We're going to get cold shots of air, but they'll just be that cold shots, not sustained long-term cold. There is some support, at least uh, in the model in the tropics. And so let's focus in on the middle graphic first. You see how the MJO, all the little the squiggly lines kind of tell us where the forecast is going. None of them are jumping out and doing this. Now, reason why I say that is if we could come over to phase seven, eight, one, and two, those tend to be our colder phases for North America. Let me show you here. Here's phase five. You see how the cold air tries to stay anchored over Alaska, and we tend to have more mild conditions across the U.S. You know, phase six is up here. We let that colder air come a little bit farther to the south. At least the tropics are correlated with that, and we saw that. But nothing's jumping out really quickly into phase seven, which brings the colder air further to the south, and phase eight, which just anchors it across the eastern part of North America. So when the model is just continuing to forecast the MGO to stay here, and not do this, it's at least being consistent with itself in that long-term forecast. Now remember, once we get out past about day 15, there's so many little factors that can change this. And I think we just need to see if the MJO is properly forecast by the European long range here and stays in phase five and six, or does it really jump out? And that's going to have a lot to do with this La Nina. We have seen a weakening of the La Nina. So we've kind of bottomed out in temperatures here, and we started to see warming at times over here in Nina region three and one and two. But in the central Pacific Nina region 3.4, we're just hovering right around a degree Celsius below average. Now we'd expect based on climatology that this would begin to, to weaken this time of year. And just thinking about that, I want to go back to my analog years for La Nina. So what I did again on this graphic is 2020 is the thick dark line. And we saw that going back to the beginning of the year till now, it's, it's reached the bottom. But you see the analog years, like almost every La Nina, begin to make the turn and go back toward neutral conditions as we get past the, the end of the year. Now, using those analog years only, so please understand that I'm only using analog years. We're going to talk precip first, and these are the ones that I've pulled into this analysis. It tended to be wet in the Pacific Northwest and Northern California. We were dry in Southern California, dry in the Southern Plains compared to average, and dry over the Southeast. We did have a pretty active Ohio River Valley storm track going up through the Great Lakes in the Northeast, though. Now, the, the reason why we do this is because if that is the pattern we see January through March, this drought monitor map won't change too much. We'll end up uh, relieving some of the drought in the northwest, but preserving it and maybe even expanding it in the southern plains and in the southwest and starting to see it emerge over the southeast. And, and no, I'm not excited about that. And I hope, I really hope that the analysis is, is incorrect here and the pattern does change at some point. Uh, but from there, though, I can at least look at what the long range models are saying. So we've already taken a look at this. This is the new uh, European model for January, February, March, and you can see it's wetter here and it's got that active Ohio River Valley storm track, but you can see it's favoring drier conditions, not only in the Southern Plains, but getting back toward the Southwest and over the Southeast. And, and the NMME, the National Multimodel Ensemble run in the uh, US and Canada here, it's kind of got the same setup. Do you see it? Uh, and again, this is a testament to the atmosphere's inability to really crank out that subtropical jet. Now, if we go over and talk about temperatures, so now these maps are, are temperatures here, we tended to be, I'll just I'll kind of draw a line around it like that. That's where it tended to be colder than average uh, in these regions and quite warm down here over the southern plains heading over toward the east coast. Now, this would be a pretty sizable shift over what we've had over the last month, and that's the map that's over there uh, on, the, on the left, where this whole quadrant has been much warmer than average. Still bitterly cold because we're in Canada here, but uh, warmer than average. So thinking about the long-range forecast, I'm just going to show you one map from the European because the enemy looks the same. The models are, are kind of trying to keep the warmest air very in a very similar location to where the the uh, analog years are, plus the warmth you see here. But when cold air is let out, you can almost see its source region cutting through the Canadian prairie here into the northern part of the United States. I think that's going to be uh, outside of a major polar vortex disruption or outside of a big flip in the MJO. This is going to be the background state of the atmosphere.
So some new stuff to show you. This is from the IRI multi-model group, and you can see the story continuing to build here. Uh, what do we notice is that January, February, March, the model's favoring you know that area as possibly seeing drier risks, and that is that's very consistent with our analysis with wetter conditions in the Northwest in the Ohio River Valley. It also keeps things warm here, and like we talked about, the cold air, when let out, uh, will be coming through the central plains to the eastern Corn Belt pretty pretty regularly. From there, I just want to come back to the same idea. Let's watch again these analog years for La Nina, reaching a peak now at the end of the year and starting to recover. Last two maps I want to show you. This is just kind of brand new this morning. I ran this. So only for those analog years, what about January, February, March precipitation patterns? And that's all we're going to look at is the pattern here. We tended to be near average or wetter than average here and drier down here in Argentina. Do you see that? And the European's latest forecast, it actually is very similar to that. Can, can you see the long range from the European is wet here? It's drier as you get way up in northeastern Brazil and also drier down here in Argentina. So I am seeing some consistency in the analogs and the forecasts. But, you know, my first statement in every one of these videos is there's a lot of speculation in this. And I'm only pulling on a few variables to produce the forecast. But it's the analysis that I want to present to you. And it's what I think we should be watching as the major features that are controlling the background state of the atmosphere. So we'll wrap it up there. Appreciate your attention. We'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks.